Glad you could join us here tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful one. If I can get the sun to go down just a little longer or a little farther and out of my eyes. So, well, if you will, let's rise and we'll join in singing and start worshiping tonight in a beautiful evening with uh, I Can Sing of Your Love Forever.
guys. We had a live video that was going and it cut out and so I've started another one. So I hope you've rejoined us. Well, actually, you're, you're muted, um, I'm muted. Um, so if you can hear me now, you found us again. If you can't hear me now, well, you didn't find us again, but I hope you will. I hope you will find us. Uh, so kids, hey, wait a minute. If I step over here, no, it's still my face. Um, so, um, hey, uh, for, so for the kids, what are you, what question is everybody asking you right now? Probably getting super annoying. Since it's the middle of August, what question is everybody asking you right now? It's probably getting real annoying. Are you ready for school, right? Any of you get tired of hearing that? Any of you guys get tired of hearing that? Are you ready? I get tired. I used to get tired of hearing that. So, but I got to thinking about that. So, so who's really getting ready for school? Are you getting yourselves ready for school? Who's doing all the work? Mom's doing all the work. And, and guess, guess who else is doing a lot of work? Your teachers are doing a lot of work. So you're, you're doing a little bit of work, getting some, getting some supplies together. Uh, but guess what? While you're doing that, and actually your mom's doing it, but while you're doing that, your teachers are working really hard, especially this year, because everything's so crazy, uh, to make sure that their classrooms are ready and they have all the stuff they need and everybody can be safe. And so today we're going to talk about being prepared to believe. And so in, our, in the scripture I'm going to read in a minute, we're talk, going to talk about two groups of people. One people heard uh, Paul preach and they rejected it, right? They kind of knew that what Paul was saying was, was, was right on, was true, uh, but they didn't want any part of it. They rejected it. While another group of people heard the same exact sermon and they believed. And it says that the reason they believed, the word that uh, the Bible I'm going to read uses is, is appointed. Those who were appointed to believe, those who were ready to believe. Now, do you think they made themselves ready to believe? Did you guys make yourself ready for school? No, so who do you think made those people ready to believe? Who do you think prepared those people to receive the message? God did. That's exactly right. God. So every time somebody believes in Jesus, it's because the Holy Spirit is working in their heart and they're responding to that. None of us, none of us just wakes up one morning and decide, well, I guess, you know, I'm going to go be a Christian now, right? But God has to work in our hearts and we have to allow that to happen. Just like we have to understand that we have to be ready for school and that other people have to help us. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that the Holy Spirit is working in all of our hearts to prepare us to receive the good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Nope. Our scripture reading this morning comes from uh, the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 44 through 52. Listen to the word of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first, since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas 
and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit, the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are in Acts chapter 12 today, and I want to apologize because um, for some reason, it's my fault because I write the thing, right? Uh, the study guide for chapter 12 is all messed up. I think there's a section missing or a couple sections missing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So I apologize for that, and I hope that study guide uh, notwithstanding, I hope that your following along in, in the book of Acts because your reading the scriptures is far more important than anything I'm writing in the study guide. So I hope you're still uh, still doing that. Well, Paul and Barnabas are in the city of Antioch in Pistia. Uh, not to be confused with Antioch in Syria. That's where we were a couple weeks ago. Um, Antioch, I guess, is like Springfield. Nobody's sure which state it's in, uh, but there's lots of them. Um, and Mark had left them and returned home by this point. Um, I'm sorry, we're in Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 13. Uh, most of Acts chapter 13, then, is a sermon which Paul preached in the synagogue. And that was Paul's usual practice, is when he arrived in a city to go to the synagogue to begin uh, preaching to uh, the Jewish congregation that was there. And sometimes it went really well, and sometimes it didn't go very well as all, at, at all. And we're going to see how that unfolds in the coming weeks. And the people must have liked uh, what they heard, at least at first, uh, because they were invited back the next Sabbath. And that's where, where our story picks up today. It's the next Sabbath. The next Sabbath... The only difference is, is now there's a bunch of Gentiles in the synagogue, and this makes the Jews nervous, and they start arguing with Paul. And so it, it's as if um, they were all well and good with what Paul had to say, as long as it was kind of an internal discussion about the Jewish faith. But when when Gentiles start showing up, and then then that raises that. Um, religious racism that we're seeing throughout the book of Acts that the gospel is overcoming and uh, makes the Jews jealous, makes the Jews angry. And so they reject God's word. And Paul says that since, since they reject, since the Jews have rejected God's word, they were going to turn now primarily or exclusively to the Gentiles. And verse 48 says, when the Gentiles heard this, heard that now Paul was going to start preaching to them, uh, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. And so right here in the space of, of uh, two verses, uh, verse 46 Verse 47 uh, quotes some Old Testament scripture in verse 48. So right here in these uh, three little verses, uh, we've uncovered one of the biggest problems, one of the biggest debates in all of the Bible and all of church history. Uh, you may know it as the debate between Calvinism or predestination and free will. Uh, just to give you a thumbnail sketch, uh, basically Calvinism says is that before God even created the world, he knew everyone he was going to create. Um, he decided everyone he was going to create, and he decided uh, which of those people were going to believe and be saved and which people were not going to believe and be saved. And there's really nothing that you and I can do about it except play along. Um, that's Calvinism. And if you say, gee, that doesn't sound right, well, you're in the right place, because if there's one thing that we can say for certain about Methodism is that it is a rejection of Calvinism. And so we would say that we would fall more on the free will side. But there's an error there as well. I want to get into in a minute. So 
On the one hand, you have this verse that says the Jews, the Jewish leaders at least, have rejected the gospel. And on the other hand, you have this group of Gentiles who accepted the gospel, but verse 48 seems to say that they accepted the gospel because they were appointed for eternal life. How does this make sense? Because verse 46 and verse 48 must both be true because they're both in the Bible, right? Um, so they have to both be true. So how do we make sense of this? Uh, well, let me give you... Let me give you this for a try. The Jews in this story knew in their hearts because God had opened their hearts, God had opened their minds. They knew that all of this was true, that everything that Paul was preaching about, they knew it was true, but they rejected it. Like Luke 730 says, the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purposes for themselves. So God has a plan for us. God has a purpose for us. God has shown us the way, but we can still reject it. Why? Because the Jews valued their religious and racial superiority even more than they valued salvation, even more than they valued truth, even more than they valued eternal life. That was less important to them than maintaining their, their religious and cultural minor, uh, monopoly. So that says this, it's possible to know the truth and reject it. As a matter of fact, the Greek word apethomai means, which is translated rejected here, means to throw away. It implies that you've got to have something and then you throw it away. At the same time, shifting our attention to verse 48, Jesus says himself in John 6, 44, that no one, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to me in, unless their heart is drawn to me. Uh, you know, no one's going to come up with this on their own. No one's going to just just suddenly uh, turn from not knowing me to knowing me by their own imagination, their own intelligence, their own goodness, that's not going to happen. And so anyone who believes in Jesus does so as a result of and in response to the work of the Holy Spirit in their life by what is called prevenient grace, the grace of that comes before. See, prevenient grace is what makes these two verses make sense together. It's this idea that each and every man and woman, each and every boy and girl, each and every human being that has ever drawn breath on the face of the earth, that God is working in their hearts to draw them to himself through his son. We can cooperate with that or we can reject it but it is going on in every single human heart think about think about the the person in that you know about now forget about public figures and you know mass criminals and, and all that it's easy for us to talk about that historical figures think about the person you personally know now who's the farthest from god the person you currently know right now who's the farthest from God. You got him? You don't have to say their name, but you got him? God is working in their heart. I promise you, God is working in their heart. And God may want to use you. Or maybe, maybe God doesn't want to use you. Maybe that bridge is burnt. That's okay. You don't have to put yourself in, in danger or jeopardy. But know this, that God is working in their heart. And just like God worked in your heart. You're not here tonight because you're smart. You're not here tonight because you're good. You may be good and you may be smart. 
Uh, but that's not the reason you're here. You're here because the grace of God invaded your heart. You're here because the Holy Spirit took hold of your heart and drew you to the Father through the Son. That's the only reason any of us is here. So it's not so much that we believe in a free will, like we can kind of come and go and we'll figure it out eventually. It's not so much that we believe in a free will, we believe in a freed will. A heart that has been invaded and overtaken by the grace of God and set free to respond to the good news of the gospel. You see, we have been talking about arranged meetings throughout the book of Acts. Philip and the Ethiopian, uh, Peter and Cornelius, uh, Paul and Ananias, all these were arranged meetings. God was preparing the person to uh, share the gospel. God was preparing the person to receive the gospel. God was arranging the circumstances under which they would meet and have the opportunity to encounter each other. God was making appointments, if you will. God was setting things up. But see, the individuals were still free. The individuals still were still free to reject, to resist, to turn down the offer. Philip could have ignored God's command to go to the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian could have told Philip to leave him alone. Cornelius could have ignored the vision that he was given. As a matter of fact, he says, I was not disobedient to the vision. Peter could have ignored the vision that prepared him to go to Cornelius. Paul could have stayed blind in Damascus. Ananias could have given in to his fear rather than gone and ministered to him. I'm reminded of the book of Esther, where Mordecai says to Esther, who knows whether you have been elevated to this position for such a time as this. But then Mordecai says, but, but if you don't do it, God will find someone else. Look, Esther's great. You should check it out. If you don't do it, God will find somebody else. You see, God made all the arrangements there in Antioch that day. God made arrangements for Paul and Silas to be in that synagogue. Paul, God made arrangements for them to preach the gospel. God made arrangements for the Jews to hear it, but they chose to reject it. God made arrangements for the Gentiles to hear it, and they accepted it. They kept the appointment that God has, had made for them. Provenient grace is at work in all people. Some people respond and others do not. And God calls each and every one of us to be ministers of his provenient grace through our words and our actions. Remember that person I asked you to think of a minute ago? God has used you. And God will continue to use you. You are not responsible, though, for the outcome. I want to tell you know why I preach Provenient Grace so much? Because it takes a big load off of me. Because otherwise, I'd be up here singing and dancing, trying to impress you. Um, and because, my gosh, you know, I got to get them saved. I got to get them saved. I got I to gotta proclaim the gospel clearly enough and compellingly enough that, that, that their hearts will be changed. And that's a lot of pressure for a preacher, ain't it, Bruce? That's a lot of pressure for a preacher. Until I decided, guess what? That's not my job. That's not my job. Proclamation is the work of the church. Proclamation is the work of the church. Proclamation is the work of the clergy and the laity. But conversion, conversion is the work exclusively of the Holy Spirit. 
I've not converted anybody. 18 years in ministry, I'll stand right here. I've not converted anybody. Have I been there when it happened? Yes, several times, praise God, but I haven't converted a single solitary soul because that's not my job. Not everyone will respond to our message. Some just aren't ready yet. Some simply reject it. But Paul and Barnabas responded to rejection just like Jesus said to do in Luke 9, 5. They shook the dust off of their feet. See, I believe that God is working in every heart. If you are a believer today, it's because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you are not a believer yet, here today, online, seeing me in the future, the Holy Spirit is at work in your life too. And you have an appointment. And today may be your appointment. Today may be the day, whether you're seeing this live, whether you're seeing it later, today may be the day that God has set for you to respond to the message. Today might be the day that has been prepared for you, that your heart is open, that your heart is ready. So don't reject him. Because all of us have to be prepared to believe. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you so much that your Holy Spirit is at work. God, your, your church has a job and your preachers have a job and your, your people have a job in sharing the gospel and loving, loving the world. But God, the real work is yours. The work of changing hearts, the work of opening minds, the work of setting spirits free, that's yours. And God, you have made an appointment for us to be here today. For whatever reason, you've called each and every one of us here today. None of us is here by accident. And God, we have kept the appointment. We have showed up. And God, we wait for the blessing that you have for us today. God, we pray that you would continue to open hearts. We pray that you would continue to work in lives. And God, I just want to take a minute. Not a minute, a couple seconds. God, that... that person that I asked this congregation to, to picture in their head, that person that they know that's far from God. I just want to take a moment of silence to lift them up in prayer, each and every person for their own, for their own name, for their own face. God, I pray for our church. I pray that you'd bless us and help us to grow and prosper. Help us to worship and serve you in spirit and in truth and serve the world in your name. God, I pray for the whole body of Christ throughout the world and all of your faithful people in every nation and every denomination. And God, I pray for the persecuted church. I pray for the United Methodist Church. I pray for this annual conference in our Bishop Lori, this district, and our Superintendent Doug. I pray for our community, our nation, our world in these troubled times. God, I pray for uh, people that have been affected by the storms in this past week and all the damage that has been done, damage to homes and businesses and crops. God, I pray that you would uh, move alongside those people. God, and draw them close to you and draw them close to each other. God, I pray for an end to this coronavirus and and all the upheaval and turmoil it's caused and for restoration in our communities. God, I pray just for your peace in our world. I pray for the men and women who serve us at home, home and abroad, our world leaders at every level. And I pray for ourselves, our families, our church, our community, our nation, and the whole world, the blessings of peace, justice, health, safety, freedom, stability, prosperity, and holiness. And God, I pray that you'd hear every prayer, each and every prayer here today, those that are here in this parking lot, those that are joining us online, those that will be joining us online later, God, that you would, in, in these moments, hear our prayers as we lift them up to you, either silently or aloud, saying, in Jesus' name, amen.
and Loving God, you've heard our prayers here this morning and you hear the prayers that remain silent upon our hearts. And God, when we do not know how to pray, your spirit intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And God, we pray that you'd hear us now as we lift our voices together in the prayer which our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd ask you to stand with me now as we profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bruce. Or Bruce. Oh. <laughs> Man. Just... <laughs> All right. Well, with that, let's uh, let's close tonight because obviously I'm too tired. <laughs> with... <laughs> From the day. <laughs> Ah uh -huh.
Till the very moment when I come home I'll sing, I'll dance, my heart will overflow From the day you saved my soul From the day you saved my soul Receive this benediction. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit go with you now and remain with you always. Let us go into the world to make disciples of Jesus Christ, experiencing grace, exploring truth, expressing love. Amen. Save my soul from the day you save.